Dinner TV. I'm your host, Althea Provost, and today's guest is Dr. Mary Hensley. In this interview, we will explore her spiritual awakening, a near-death experience, recent UFO contact experiences, and more. Dr. Mary Hensley is the author of Promised by Heaven, A Doctor's Return from the Afterlife to a Destiny of Love and Healing, co-author of Bringing Death to Life, and The Chakra Fairies, a children's book offering magical mantras. Welcome, Mary Hensley, to Inner TV. Thank you, Alfie. I'm so excited to be here. I'm thrilled that you have an opportunity to talk about the wisdom that you've gained in your spiritual process, including that 1991 car accident, which resulted in a crossing over. What could you share with our audience, our awakened spiritual audience, about the spiritual process? One thing is, uh, no matter what anybody believes, it happens to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> And to me, that brings a lot of great comfort because, you know, as, as we all have experienced, there's a, a lot of different belief systems out there. There are some people who feel like they believe in nothing. There are some people who have complete faith in a certain religious criteria, dogma, um, rules. There are other people who are undecided. And it's kind of like, what happens to everybody? What happens to all of those people? And, you know, that used to plague me as a child. I was the daughter of a Southern Baptist minister and grew up in the Bible Belt of America. Yeah, I was the one with the hand always shooting up in Sunday school and, and going, that doesn't make sense. And they'd say something else, that just simply doesn't make sense to me. And I had always, always questioned and thought outside of the box, but my life was, was less than ordinary as it was. So... I had been experiencing visits from my grandfather who had died when I was one and I'd been in complete contact and communication with him from, from my entire childhood and well, still to this day. And so, um, you know, life has taken an interesting twist and it, you know, if I've learned one thing and I look back at all of the things that have happened to me, you know, that accident, coming back with the gift afterwards, the healing, the psychic ability, the foresight, the dreams, all of that, we all have that available to us. It's just another discipline. And so I am very much so about teaching people how to use the tools if they have the discipline to use them. I can't force that discipline. I can plant the seed with the tools. Uh, but really, it's up to the individual as to, as to where they want to go and what they want to do with that. We, we find a lot of uh, comfort in saying, ah, well, sure, you know, that's easy for you because you have this ability or this ability or you're, you know, you're awakened or you're this or that. Look, we all have it available to us if, if, we, if we choose to use it. And I agree with you. I, I love the line when you said, even Jesus doesn't heal everyone's sugar. As the story goes, I continue to pick and choose very carefully just how much and what. I thought I could handle, and that was your discernment piece rising. You can have all these gifts and abilities, and you can tell people, yes, this is inside you. You have this opportunity should you take the path consciously. But at the same time, recognizing that, you know, during spiritual awakening processes, dark nights of the soul, spiritual crises, not everybody wants to take that path. Absolutely. If I were honest with you, after 27 years of doing this, I would say the majority don't want to take that path. I was speaking today to somebody. We got on the same subject and I was saying, listen, you know, I've had cancer twice. I had a brain tumor a couple of years ago. I've, I've had a lot of stuff happen in this body. And because I've also used my body kind of as an experimental field because I do work with so many people and I, I tend to take things into my body, figure out how to get rid of them and then share that with other people. Um, as I hit 50 and get older, I think I'm going to back off on that a little bit because <laughs> it's getting old now. But it gave me this wealth of knowledge about the human form. And it also gave me the ability to really connect deeply with people, particularly with very strange ailments or illnesses or diagnoses. And, and I could go, yeah, I've had that. I know, I know where you're coming from. And let me tell you what I did to move through that. And let me tell you what emotional connections I found associated with this. And so, yeah, you first half of my life has been one of self-imposed uh, guinea pig, basically. I wouldn't change it for the world. I was having that conversation today with somebody saying, listen, you know, I've used SEAC tea, I've used uh, CBD oil, I've used, uh, there are some people who use chemo and radiation, there are other people who, who have used meditation. 
I personally work with frequency. I've seen people heal with every one of those things. Yes, 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 and yes. Have I also seen people not successfully heal with those things? Yes, 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 and yes. And the reason for that is that the intention of the individual and where they are on the path, I believe you could probably heal yourself with a lovely glass of water if your intent was crystal clear and pure. But that is a a very, very hard thing to achieve. You know, I agree takes, with you. And it I, takes and a I discipline. Think sometimes, yeah. uh, yes, and the blocks can not just be this lifetime. You know, it's like you, you had said, just because we have the knowledge to transform our lives does not mean that we always choose it. We can literally see the light, yet make the choice to remain in the dark. And part of that is yeah. the layers and layers and layers that we are uh, as a spirit. I am taking a group to Starseed Greece for an adventure, and I had to do three months of literally excavating the energies of Atlantis. And that's not an easy one for anyone to want to open its book and read from its chapter. I felt buried under ash for at least three months. And by the time I came out of a very deep spiritual awakening in that process of recognizing timelines and and how it affects this lifetime, I literally felt like my skin was pink starting to slough off <laughs> from being resurrected. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go through the emotional processes that I didn't quite finish off in that lifetime. Right. So, you know, that's the whole point of the metaphor of, of the, you know, the betrayal, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. Every religion has them. And, you know, they're trying desperately to put it right in our eyes, but without just directly giving us the answer funny that you say that. I sit here with my, my phone propped on a book, Atlantis, The Antediluvian World by Ignatius Shonley. I should talk about that because I'm currently researching the, the new book that I'm writing called Apotheosis, which begins 13,774 years ago with the Atlas- Atlantean Cataclysm and my memory of that. And then it moves forward with me to present time. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to ask you, in the book, there was hesitancy about you really looking at that piece in your lifetime, uh, in this lifetime. Are you moving through it? How do you feel about it? Yeah, it's interesting because my memory of that time was the most important thing around that were these symbols. And I actually came to Ireland chasing those symbols because there was that part of me that that knew that High Brazil, of course, which no longer exists off the coast of Ireland visibly, and Ireland itself were actually part of what I believe was the land bridge that that at one point, many, many thousands of years ago, connected the continent of North America with Europe. Um, and then, you know, of course, that landscape changed over time. And then with that last final cataclysm was when we, we saw that land mass go under and other land masses come up. And so knowing that Ireland was connected to that on some level, I had a, it wasn't a choice to come here. This isn't as beautiful and wonderful. And I love Ireland to bit. Um, it wasn't my first, maybe on my second or third choice of where I would have ultimately lived, but it wasn't my first choice. Um, I, I tend to go where I'm told by this, you know, by my group of advisors, my, my council, I call them that I work with. Um, and this was where I needed to be. And oh boy, you know, it's been amazing because this is where so many discoveries have come to fruition. But those symbols that were that lasting memory of that lifetime in Atlantis, um, I have finally, you know, I said I'll be 50 in a couple of weeks. And it's taken me half of this lifetime to finally discover um, a group of individuals who are able to help me unlock the symbols. They're they're holographic. Of course, when you see them in a book, they're too... 2D flat iconographs, but they're storehouses of information. Kind of think of each one like a USB key full of information. And they're actually a frequency. And so I have been looking my whole adult life for a way to unlock the frequency out of the symbol. And so found a group in the UK, a group of physicists who were going to be able to run this thing. Uh, We've had to create the symbols out of brass and run them through a machine that allows us to get a holographic image from a, more or less a negative of the symbol, and it then generates a frequency, and we're allowed uh, able to then map the frequency. And so I believe that the frequencies then 
in addition to being storehouses of information from that last time period in Atlantis and prior, so more or less the history of where we came from before then, they also, in certain combinations and in use of the primer symbol that was with them, I believe they unlock certain portal spaces around around the planet. So in essence, you're moving from 3D to 4D into 5D where someone could tesseract them into another dimension. When you're using that portal symbol, what does that portal symbol look like? The portal symbol, that's the primer is, it looks like if you pictured a cross and then you put another X through that, so it's a six-point star. That long line is, the, the center line is longer and then the, you know, the other three are, are shorter, but more or less on in a flat iconograph, it looks like a six-point star. Wow. Have you been able to go through the portals and discover where they lead to? No, we're only just like, I literally just found me, actually my business partner that I, I have this frequency project with, he's the one who found these guys. And finally, we're getting some headway on what to do with these things because I feel like I've been protecting them for not just this lifetime, but forever, you know, and right. I've, I've come across three people in my entire experience here on this planet, three people who even remotely knew what these symbols were. So wow. it, this is a big, big deal for me because everything that I do revolves around frequency. And if I can get to the point where I can unlock these things and assist people on whatever level that those allow me to, then, you know, yay, um, my work here is done. But what we're doing with those frequencies, though, is kind of what we were talking about earlier. And the people who are kind of hesitant to step forward into that power what I found after all these years of healing was I was hitting a point of frustration a couple of years ago, and I was like, there has got to be something else to this that I am missing because when I died in that accident, I come back in with this ability to channel energy or frequency, and like somebody comes into the office and has cancer, we go in, we, we get to the space where we talk about the emotional component, where this came from in their history, um, and then if somebody was in the right space at the right time, bang, we could we could shift this thing. And then what I was finding, though, with people who weren't dealing necessarily with a, a life-threatening ailment, but let's say emotional distress um, or other physical distresses, and I'm like, what is going on here? Because we're getting into a space, they're in here, we're channeling that energy through, they're having that healing session, they feel fantastic when they leave, and then they go back into their own world and they go flat again. And what was frustrating me was that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we want to access those frequencies, the ones that I was able to hit when out of body in that death experience, I know that everyone who wants to get to that can do that without having to die. But the key component is the discipline to do it. And this is where people people run into a problem because we can say, no, 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 I don't want to die. I need to stay. I want to do this and that. And you put a plan in front of somebody and it involves doing something for 28 days, you're going to lose 75% of them. That's right. It, They'll start out strong and then, it's and then drop like, yes. Drop yes. like flies. Yep. <laughs> Yes, that's why evolution is uh, uh, takes lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. We might gain the skill of seership in one lifetime. We might strengthen that over lifetimes, and then we exactly. get to a point we can take that seership and move where you are, where you can take responsibility for the symbols, which is taking us back to, to Atlantis. Um, I actually had a positive lifetime in Atlantis, but because I'm taking a group, I was working with Athena. Athena put an energetic block in front of my heart so that every moment that I woke up to work on this project, I had to move through the levels of, I wouldn't say anguish, but the levels of trauma that was unresolved from the fall of Atlantis. And so that I could, one, be a bridge to compassion, have the understanding. Mm-hmm. So as I was right. going through Atlantis and feeling, you know, what's it like to abuse power? What's it like to uh, harm people for power or to want to uh, control? In my lifetime in Atlantis, I was a gray. And for Atlantis, for me, it was a colony, an interstellar colony. We were able to 
harness the energy of like wind and that was my my role in atlantis at that time i had some students go rogue where they took power and abused it and i've had a very difficult time this lifetime sharing information openly because of that reason the wisdom piece the discernment piece had to come in you don't pour in information to people who don't have the level of wisdom to be responsible for but Mm -hmm. coming back to now People do have that responsibility. They're afraid of the power. Mm -hmm. There's a deeply ingrained cellular memory of that. And, you know, you're not talking about just one incarnation of Atlantis. I mean, there were a minimum of five that I know of um, incarnations of the civilization of Atlantis. You know, and then you go go back beyond that and you're into Lemurian times. And, um, you know, and they kind of cross over in in the end as you move into the, the rise of Atlantis. But it's amazing what cellular memory can do to people. And that is one of probably one of my, my most interesting aspects of my work is some of the stories that have come up where people in present time are dealing with things that they have been everywhere to every doctor to every everybody and there is no logical reason for what's going on with them a particular ailment a particular phobia those stories are actually quite fun to go back into to find out what cellular memory was left behind you know and we've become very flippant we're like ah look at we can't change the past just get on with it and you know move forward think positively move forward or drop the story which is is huge in the new age industry you know drop the story story, and i'm like you are not done with that story and to deny the histories that are coming before you to deny the wealth of information well it also is you know it doesn't allow if someone is in the capacity of, of channeling or facilitating energy or healing towards somebody and their sole focus is for the story to be dropped and for that individual just to sit in the feeling, then, you know, you've you've already closed off one of the most valuable pathways to getting to know that individual's story in order to assist them in their healing. But it is, you're right, it has become a a very popular avenue and one that, yeah, it irks me a bit. (laughs) But... um, well, we're talking yeah, so continuity. It's, 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 when you come back into pure energy, like you said, I mean, we're, we forget, okay? So we're, we're pure yeah. energy. We're manifesting, creating, and healing ourselves. We're just this, this abundant flow of life and light. And so to understand the continuity is to understand the, all the manifestations that you've ever been, to bring in that wisdom, and at the same time to apply that wisdom so we're not recreating the same mistake or trauma or drama over and over and over. Exactly. Exactly. This is where I use frequency, and there's one in particular, the um, 417 hertz. Let's talk about even a present time situation where you might have someone who's 50 years of age who was raped as a 12-year-old. Um, and while they've done, you know, they say they've done their work and they've been through their counseling and they've spent time healing and meditating and forgiving and doing whatever, yet they still find themselves in bother. And this just used to fascinate me. And, you know, they were like, I know, listen, people keep telling me, look, the past is in the past. I can't do anything about it now. I've got to move forward. And I'm going, here's what's so interesting. People don't realize the only reason that you even have memory is because it is a frequency, a vibration that is storehoused in your physical form on a cellular level that also transmutes into kind of an etheric blueprint of the story of your life. You can change any frequency. Now, it doesn't mean that the the person wasn't still raped when they were 12, but it absolutely removes the charge that it holds for the individual. And once you take the charge out of it, it becomes yet another factual event that you can open a book, you can read it, you can close it, put it back on the shelf. You can take from it the wisdom, the lessons, the learning, the growth without having the destructive charge still connected to it what that, that leads one trapped in their path. Agreed. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal. It's fascinating. Yes, and then it's just a story that you can use to transmit the information so that people can get it. You know, I would like to say in Atlantis as well, it's been said that you know during the darker times, because Atlantis was a high civilization and experiment, actually it was 
the king was Palladian, and it was an experiment that went horribly, horribly dark and wrong at the end. And so, one could say, uh, they used frequency in music to control the people. The thing is, is that in an experiment, frequency hertz were used to basically disable the free will <laughs> of others. And we see that today. It's nothing new. And But we also have healing frequencies that do, just like you said, come in, unlock the story, resolve the charge, and close the book. Absolutely. We have and that, that opportunity this, today. Absolutely we do. And um, my business partner in Los Angeles is a, a frequency engineer and definitely not of this world. And... What we are doing is we have created a means. We have a website already up with with all of these frequencies available that people can go to themselves. And you know they know that they've been they're they're pure, they're distortion free, digitally mastered by by someone who genuinely understands how these frequencies operate. And then we educate the people as to what each frequency does, and then they utilize them in a way that they want to make changes in their own lives. And all we explain to them is how they work and the discipline that it takes to do that. Because basically what it's all about is in the physical form, it's basically collapsing neural pathways of old behavioral patterns, filling in those potholes, growing some new synapses, and then creating new neural pathways that allow you to respond differently to the environment around you in a more productive way. And when people are like, oh, okay, you mean I can actually do that myself? Yes, that's actually what we call healing. And here it is. Here's the key how to do it. If you want to do this in your life, if this something that feels comfortable for you and you're ready to move forward or, and let go of the charge of your path and bring forward the beautiful wisdom and lessons and growth from all of those wonderful opportunities that you had in your path, then have at it. Here you go. It's available to you. It's about giving the power back to the people. Of course. Which hertz are you working in? 528, 432, 741? Yes, 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 and yes. So we're going, we work through all the solfeggios, but we all, he's incredible what he's been able to do. So I, I gave him basically this very impossible list of demands. <laughs> and I said, you know, when someone leaves my place, I need them to have homework. I want them to become so involved because it's no different. You know, you can't claim to be somebody who is empowering another individual and hiding it behind spirituality, which when in actuality it's no different than going to the doctor and looking for a pill or a drug or whatever that's going to make them better. If somebody's coming in, they're laying on your table and you're you're chanting or doing frequencies over them or energy or light or whatever, and you're still expected to be the one that fixes them, it's absolutely no different. It's just dressed in different clothing. I was yeah. extremely frustrated with this, and I said, I've got to be able to have something to give back to the people. And so he was able, this Greg Capania, who's my engineer, was able to create the most beautiful combinations of frequencies. They're like little seven-layer cakes, all of them. They're gorgeous, where he's taking the pure tone frequency, and they're layered in with binaural tones, like the chronic beats, and, you know, the pure tone of the frequency and then some beautiful music composed on top of this. And you're just like floating and it's great. And you've got this fade away going through. So you're drifting off into this fabulous sleep. Or if it's the one, you know, that you're using during the daytime, an alpha wave is in there. I mean, there's just every option available for everything. It's all about just educating someone and there's no force, no, no nothing. It's here is how this works. If you want to use this, here you go. You know, this is what go. it's going to make this work. I'm not asking anybody to do anything that I didn't do with myself. And it was through trial and error that I figured out how long. You know, most of the popular neuroscience scientists of, of the time, you know, Dr. Joe Dispenza um, will talk about a three-week time frame that it takes to retrain a neural pathway um, in response to a um, particular frequency either achieved through a meditative state, a dream, you know, at least a dreaming state, uh, that it takes three weeks to do that. Me, I say 28 days because, number one, I'm a woman and my body works on a 28-day cycle. And, you know, our lunar cycle is 28 days. And I would much prefer to err on the side of, okay, I did an extra week. <laughs> and so I have discovered through the use of these frequencies and using them with thousands of people and, and being able to actually be there in the field watching the changes and taking the notes, 
okay, I know this frequency works for fear. I know this frequency is working when someone is dealing with self-loathing. I know that when someone, for instance, I am actually mentoring somebody right now who's writing a book with her deceased mother. And the reason she first came to me was because she knew that I could talk to people who had passed on. And she was like, I love this concept. And there's some things I'd like to ask my mom. And I said, why don't you ask her yourself? And she's like, what? Oh, well, how is that possible? And I said, look, 963 hertz pops through that pineal gland and takes us into that space where we're so close to the glass feeling here in the earth realm and it is a frequency that beings who are not in a physical body can comfortably lower themselves to and we can achieve that communication either in a dream state where people are going in and having the most lucid dreams and these extraordinarily tactile and meaningful experiences with someone who has had or their feeling, their complete presence around them. And it's fantastic because, you know, before they're like, oh, you have to go to a medium to do that. or Anyone can do it if you get yourself into the right phase. And so, you know, if you train your brain to, and you set an intention of this, I want to have an open communication with X, Y, or Z, And you continuously do that and you retrain that brain to achieve that state. It's going to happen. I've seen it happen far too many times to know know, it's true. And so I'm like, how much more meaningful is it to the individual rather than to have to ask somebody, hey, you know, is my mom okay? Is there anything she wants to say to me? You know, and of course you're going, of course she's okay. You know, she's out of this plane and she's in, you know, a higher elevation and to make that experience personal by the by the individual actually having the experience, what a difference. And so I'm mentoring this girl, and she writes this book with her mom, and I've taught her to go into that space through 963 Hertz and to speak to her mother herself. And it's quite incredible. It's going to be a book like you've never seen. And that's the power of being able to put the, these into the hands of, of, of people who are willing to use them. Double advocate, when we're going through our awakening process, when, like her exploring these processes, doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to face difficulty or challenge in your life path. Oh, good Lord, it means you're definitely going to face it. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to put it out game. there. There is no magical pill that makes your life magical. I mean, that's just, that's, you know. Uh, Absolutely not. But see, what people fail to understand, you know, we've really gotten into this speak, you know, like any pageant you hear or anything, what's the most famous thing they say about, you know, at the Miss America pageant, you know, and what would you like to see? What's their answer? World peace, right? And we get into this idea where we want world peace and we want to change the world. Even if you listen to Oprah Winfrey and her Super Soul Sunday podcast, she's asked almost every author, every positive motivational speaker that she has on there, one of her questions to them is fill in the blank. God is whatever. And they give their answer. And the earth needs fill in the blank. And I'm always thinking, okay, when I'm going to be sitting in front of Oprah, what am I going to say to that answer that's going to rock her little socks? And it is, the earth doesn't need anything. There's nothing wrong with the earth plane because it was designed to be a dichotomy of dark and light. And we have so disillusioned ourselves to believe, you know, that entitlement means that I'm never going to suffer. Entitlement of being here means that you understand that sometimes the suffering is the greatest gift. And we spend all of this time trying to avoid being uncomfortable We've become the most useless group of people for being uncomfortable. We hate being uncomfortable. We'll do anything to avoid it. And what's happening is we're missing some of the greatest nuggets of wisdom that are available to us. The earth plane is is one of darkness and light. That's what it is set up for. When we're raising vibration, it's our own frequency we need to raise, not the, not the planet. This planet will shake us off, as we have seen many, many times in history. It'll shake us off before we finish it off. Not a problem. This place is safe. It's we who have the issue. It's we who continuously cycle through and, and come to the brink of annihilation of ourselves as a 
species, we get silly and we, we believe that, you know, that being here means being in this perfect space of bliss and peace. If that was the case, you wouldn't need to be here because we come from that. We come from perfection in order to experience the duality and the dichotomy that's here. And so many people have that backwards. You wrote, if, if first and foremost an individual cannot take stock and accountability for their physical, emotional, and spiritual crisis, not only will the path be to healing be long and arduous, it will be next to impossible. It's going to be a very painful grind. It's what you do with that pain, though. You know, I have a thing. You know, you don't get killed in a car accident, 75 miles an hour, break your neck and die and head goes through the window and all that without some level of permanent damage. You know, so I've got a a crooked head. That's why it took me a little longer in the opticians today because, you know, my head is slightly crooked and they had to make all these adjustments to the way my eyes see because I'm not on a level plane. And I have some level of, of quite intense pain probably in comparison to what most people would experience on a daily basis. Um, every single day of my life. And you, people might go, oh, God, that's just so awful. And I'm like, yeah, not really. You know, I wake up every morning and I ask myself the same question. My eyes open and before my feet hit the floor, I evaluate, I, I scan through my body. And I'm like, all right, yeah, I'm still here. That's Yeah, that's pretty sore there. And I'm a little stiff getting up here. But is the pain that I'm in right now bigger than what I need to go do today? And the answer is inevitably no. There have been the rare times where it got me and it was too much. And I sat with it. And therein lies probably the greatest challenge of humanity. It's sitting with oneself. And such lessons, such value in that. And it, it, I look at every ache, every pain, every emotional state. And I'm just like, wow, I'm in absolute awe. And if, if, you know, I don't think I died and had that, that grand experience and came back with these gifts and all this because I was so highly switched on and evolved. I think it was actually quite the opposite. I was not getting it. And I needed that kind of a profound experience in order to shake me into the space that I'm in today. You know, so what I'm spending my time, time, time trying to teach other people is, Hey, guys, guess what? You don't have to actually die to do that. You can achieve that level of understanding and knowing where you can wake up in severe pain and still be grateful for every step you take getting into the shower, for the capacity to be able to walk downstairs and look in the mailbox and take that bill out and go, you know what? Thank you for having that electricity in the first place. Of course, I'm going to pay this bill. Might not be sure how I'm going to do it but I'm going to do it because I use that electricity and finding that that gratitude in every single little thing that you do. Um, It doesn't mean that there's no struggle. And, you know, struggle, I think, is inevitable to the human condition. I mean, how would we grow without opposing forces? As a a doctor, as a, you know, as a chiropractor, the strongest bones are those that are the ones where muscles are growing and pulling against them. And those bones get harder and stronger with just the muscle gears. That's just how we work. We work. It's how we operate. I know that you went into a brilliant light and, you know, you had your beings come before you with the celestial music. Wonderful. Have you met other people who went into a white room? A white room. I don't know. My, cause mine wasn't a room. It was like it was textured. It was like this. It was like there were walls, but there weren't any. I know it sounds so strange. It was like you could touch the atmosphere around you. And then, you know, when I went into that life of view space, it went, it was like a cinema screen around me in 360 degrees. It was like being in the middle of a fully circular stadium with my yeah, life I playing around um, <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, actually a guy that I do a lot of speaking with in L.A., um, my brother from another mother, his name is um, Peter Bedard. He wrote a book called Convergence Healing. And, Pete and I met years ago when we were speaking on the Queen Mary in Los Angeles, and I had actually finished my gig, and he was the speaker who was on after me, and we were in quite a large hall, and I was walking towards the back of the, the, back of the room because I actually really had to go to the bathroom, and Pete began to speak, and I had made it nearly to the end of the hall, and he starts telling the story, and I just stopped dead in my tracks, and I just went, I stole my story. <laughs> Our experiences in death were so similar 
And we work together so well in public speaking because one thing makes us very different. I knew I was coming back and was excited about it. He went into a deep, deep depression when he came back. And it took him many years to get out of that. You know, he was a dancer. He came in, his legs had been crushed. And um, he really went into a dark phase. Me, I was like, you know, little city cheerleader when I got back. Yeah, yeah, it's all fantastic. And, you know, we, we give this great balance of the experience. But what he saw and the space that he went to was quite similar to mine. Very, very, very similar. And then, of course, my dear friend, P.M.H. Atwater, who is probably one of the most foremost, and she is, I'm going to say, the foremost researcher on near-death experiences. She has had multiple, multiple people with the course of that same, that same experience. It's interesting. For myself, I didn't have to die. I just went up consciously, but I ended up in a white room, very similar to what I would call being on a UFO. What I was asking you is if you had come across anybody else who's gone into the white room. And I've gone in that white room with people that I was sitting across from, just lifted up and into the white room. Um, so interesting okay. that you say that. I had, um, I had some experiences over Christmas, actually, just this past Christmas. Um, I was quite ill. I got, I ended up getting pneumonia. And so I, I spent a few weeks at home in bed. I was just, I was too sick to do anything. I couldn't miss all of, all of Christmas festivities. But during that time, I've, you know, I've had some things happen throughout the course of my life. There's all been marks on my body and I'm quite, quite aware of things that have been done. But funny enough, never, never had a feeling of violation, but more work and enhancement. But this Christmas, I had a particular experience, and I'll actually send you the picture when we're done. There are these bizarre marks on my stomach, and it looked like pads, it's like surgical pads had been on stomach. I was, I remember when it was happening, it was so bright white that I was trying to open my eyes, and I couldn't get my physical eyes to open, but with my eyes closed, the light was such a brilliant light, it was blinding me. And the way I described it, it was like being under a surgical light. So I was speaking to someone else who had had that experience of fellow in the UK. So, yeah, it was um, that was quite different than the white light of dying, of going into the light and meeting with the guys and doing all that. Those two are quite different. Um, there was one of, you know, that sensation of moving into that beautiful light, but that was multicolored, multi-sound. This was an experience of being out of body, but I couldn't see anything around me but the bright white light. And that only happened just a few weeks ago. And then you woke up with scratches. They, oh, gosh. Wait till I'll send you the picture. They, they look wow. like, you know, like if you put the, um, if you were doing an EKG on somebody and you put the pads on them. And right. let's say you pulled the pads off and it left a square mark. You know, I have, yeah, I'll show you. I've got like these three Square. Nothing my body could have just manifested by itself. It definitely, you know, maybe not man-made, but something else made. <laughs> um, and you just had a, a UFO yeah. experience on your way to speak at a near-death conference out in the, I where did. was it, Seattle? That was in Washington in Seattle. Yeah, I was speaking with Evan Alexander. And on the way up, you know, unbeknownst to me, I'm like, oh, the girls, my children were, were with me and my good friend Angelica. And, you know, we're driving from Los Angeles to Seattle because I, every time we go back to America, I want my children to see you know, my country. I want to see where I grew up. And we hadn't done the East Coast or sorry, the West Coast. And so we were driving from Los Angeles to Seattle. And little did I know, um, you know, we stopped at Mount Shasta and it was starting to get very smoky. And, you know, we had to go all the way up to whatever it was, eight and a half thousand feet on Mount Shasta to get above the smoke and came back down, not realizing that the entire state of Oregon was on fire. And we drove through this. And so I literally drove for like 200 miles where I could not see 10 feet in front of me. And, you know, it was the only way we could get up there. We had to keep going. And it was the most bizarre experience. And so... We start getting to a place that was called Roseburg, I believe, Roseburg on the part of Oregon. And I could see some lights in the distance. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we're finally getting to the edge of this smoke. They called them dry lightning strikes had triggered these fires. I'm like, all right, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. We get up there, and the edge is very clear. You can see the edge of the 
on a thing to dissipate. And so Oregon is quite hilly, and, you know, we were going up an incline, and I was actually driving, and my friend was in the front seat, and my two girls were in the back seat, and I was like, what is that? And I actually pulled the car over, and I pulled over. We were on the incline up. You know, there were trucks going past us and all, and all four of us just sat there with our mouths hanging open. It was one of those moments I was like, I am so glad someone else is seeing this right now. Because so, so often I've seen things and, you know, of course people are like, yeah, sure. How come nobody else was there? And I'm like, I don't know. It just happened while I was on my own. And this time it was all four of us. And the most bizarre looking craft I have ever seen. It was like, um, um, do you remember the old things when if you go to like a drive through bank, and you, they would put through like an air tube of shoot, um, like a tube that you'd stick your money in. I don't know if you had those where you were. Sure. You had those in my hometown where you would go in like a, like a drive through and then you'd unscrew the cap, stick your deposit in, screw the cap back on, and you push it up through an air tube, and it would fly back into the building. This thing looked like one of those. It was like a tube, and there was a, a dark ring around it, and then there was a band of light. And then there was another dark ring, a band of light, and another dark ring, and the third band of light. And they all moved, you know, kind of in, in opposing directions. And this was definitely, definitely not a man-made anything because it was enormous. I mean, it was huge. Um, like several stories tall, this thing. And it was flying, and it was like this most bizarre flight pattern. And it was like it was flying all around the edge of the smoke, and it was like monitoring or looking or observing at how the fires were burning. Definitely wasn't a weather balloon unless they're making weather balloons now that are, you know, the size of a few football stadiums. Um, it was just incredible. And it was actually quite awe-inspiring. And so we just sat there, and, of course, everybody's like, where are the pictures? I swear to you, it was one of those situations where we, it was, well, first of all, it was dark. And we just sat there, and everybody was so mesmerized by what they were seeing. Nobody, nobody, even my teenagers didn't think to pull a phone out. Um, we just sat there and watched it until it was gone. Um, but it was, it was phenomenal. Definitely the best one I've ever seen. Have you felt like you can unpack that, unpack that, and come to some type of understanding of what that was? Or do you feel like it's still forthcoming? Of that particular one, um, uh -huh. you know, my really true deep sense is one of observation. Um, it was one of, it, it certainly wasn't threatening. Um, everybody else seemed to be just driving on by like nothing was happening. You would think in a case like that when you saw something of that size that somebody else would have been pulled over looking at this and, or trying to film or doing whatever. And everybody just kept driving by. And if it had been just me, I'd have been like, okay, but all four of us saw it. So it, it this makes me wonder um, if it was close in some way and we were able to see or what. I don't know. Now, I, I don't have the answers to that. And hopefully one day that will come. But it was certainly not a, you know, it was a very um, benevolent feel to it. It wasn't anything that made us feel afraid or like there was any kind of threat. This actually felt like it was watching, looking, learning, um, if not offering some kind of assistance. This time I'd like to invite you into the hot seat, a fill-in-the-blank question and answer. And just, just with your heart, answer this question for me. Since you've gone through the spiritual awakening process and you are obviously evolving into greater levels of awareness, ET consciousness, near death, these type of things, what wisdom do you have at this time to offer people who are in spiritual crisis? In spiritual crisis, probably if people would stop with the chaos in their own minds, if they could actually sit and let themselves off the hook, and I know it sounds so trivial, but it's so powerful. So much of the spiritual crisis that we, we do experience is self-imposed. And it, you know, we, we take ourselves into these very dark places. And I know there's learning and growth and understanding and evolution in that. And that's a wonderful thing. But there's an old saying in therapy where, where people, you know, were intended to use therapy as a boat to get across the river, but Oftentimes, people get, forget to get off the boat. It's that same kind of thing. It's great to be 
in a space where you're recognizing the lessons that you're learning and that you know that and knowing even that the dark night of the soul and the spiritual crisis can be the greatest springboard for evolution, it's great to know that and understand that and to be part of that. But it's also great to move on from that. It's kind of like reading the last page in the chapter of a book and refusing to turn the page, reading the same thing over and over again. And so if people let themselves off the hook where they're stuck and, and continuously flogging themselves for the same things or... Um, always trying to, to berate themselves or justify, you know, their, their crisis and experiences and pain. And if they just stop and be still and allow themselves to just appreciate who they are rather than sitting in constant judgment. Because let me tell you what, folks, when I went through that death experience, there was nobody judging me but me. I was the only one critiquing my performance. That made such a massive impact on me. So if you're, you know, you're looking to to get through crisis and you're looking, and you're the only one who's who's really calling the shots at the end of the day. You're not answering anybody else but yourself. So you may as well make some peace with you and who you are and what your experiences are and just have the deepest gratitude for every experience that comes your way. Thank you, sis. I think our Starseed audience would definitely appreciate your information that you're sharing. I'd like at this time to remind everybody to like, share, and subscribe. And once again, thank you, Dr. Hensley, for being on Inner TV. I cannot thank you enough for what you are doing. It is wonderfully powerful and very important work. Oh, blessings to you. Thank you, Marion. And until next time, everybody, bye-bye.